And I'd like to welcome all of you here to the University of Chicago Center in Delhi. My name is Gary Tubb. I'm the faculty director of this center here. And um, my own field is Sanskrit studies, so I know very little about most of what will take place in the room today. Um, but I'm very happy to be here and honored to have all of you here in the very first event that, uh, that we have had in this lecture hall. As you saw coming in, the center is still under construction. We will have our official opening uh, at the end of this month. Uh, but we're happy uh, to already have uh, such a worthwhile event um, to get us started in this room. Uh, the main aspiration of this center will be to support collaborative research uh, involving our faculty and students from Chicago and uh, scholars and students, professors, and institutions here in India. So it's uh, very nice for us to be able to have a joint effort like this uh, as, one of our, as a, one of our first activities. Um, the center exists to serve all parts of the university, all of our schools and divisions, our faculty, our students, our alumni. So I'm also very happy that this event has come about uh, with the help of some of our most distinguished alumni, especially a couple that I think you'll be hearing with at the hearing from at the very end, um, from uh, Brookings, uh, India, Rohan Sandhu, who is also uh, an alumnus of uh, our college, and uh, also um, from our um, alumni club in New Delhi, Pyle Chawla from Just Contractus, who is a graduate of our law school, and I'm hoping that they will um, summarize things for us at the end. Uh, because we are interested primarily in uh, helping to support uh, collaborations between people in <coughs> Chicago and people in India, and to foster the movement of people and ideas in both directions, uh, we do hope to uh, uh, develop relationships with our sister institutions here uh, in India. So I'm especially happy that this event is one uh, which is uh, taking place jointly between the University of Chicago and um, Brookings, India. And um, uh, I'm also very happy that uh, we have with us today, as the moderator for the second half of today's events, the um, Director of Research at Brookings, India, Dr. Shubir Gokhan. And so I'll turn it over to Dr. Gokhan right now to help me welcome you here. Uh, thank you, Gary. And uh, let me also join him in welcome, welcoming you to this uh, event, uh, the first partnership between the University of Chicago Center and Brookings, India. Uh, many of you have attended Brookings uh, events before. Uh, our uh, objective is to open up uh, debates and conversations, dialogues, differences on a variety of issues uh, related to our overall research agenda. Uh, we are looking uh, to carry out activity uh, at the end of our first year, so completing one year as the Brookings Indi Institution India Center uh, in economic development, broadly speaking, uh, foreign policy, energy and environment. Uh, but also uh, with reference to cross-cutting issues uh, like governance, gender, and technology. Uh, this theme uh, falls squarely into the governance and gender uh, interface. And uh, we have uh, research papers on two issues. One is on, uh, on uh, the, the gender and uh, the electoral process, and the other is on criminality in the electoral process. And that really explains the title that we want to have more uh, of the excluded segment in politics and we want to have less of a segment that's included. Uh, so our strategy has been to engage uh, as widely as possible with uh, stakeholders, not focused on academics alone or government alone, uh, but to bring everybody into as uh, constructive a dialogue as possible. And that is uh, the way we've gone about our events. This is certainly uh, in line with that strategy. Uh, but uh, we're also in that process looking to partner actively and constructively with uh, other institutions with, uh, with shared interests. And I'm glad to be uh, doing this uh, with the University of Chicago and also glad to be part 
of the first event in the center, which is certainly shaping up very impressively, and we hope to be uh, doing more of the same. Well, next I'll uh, introduce our first panel, and we have a very powerful lineup with some uh, uh, a very rich collection of ideas to present. So, in fact, our biggest problem is going to be uh, uh, doing all of these things in the amount of time that's allotted to us. So, for that reason, I'm going to introduce all four of our uh, participants just uh, very quickly. They're all people who are already known to you, and you can read more details about all of them in uh, uh, the program uh, for today's event. And so, I'll therefore just give you their names and identify them very briefly, and then um, turn to the business of of listening to what they have to say. The, the structure is that we will have two uh, scholars uh, presenting their uh, research on matters that are relevant to uh, the electoral process, and then we'll have two discussants uh, who will comment on, on what they've said and uh, talk about some other things. But we'll have to do all of this quite briefly since uh, in our schedule we only have about 15 minutes for each of our presenters and <coughs> only about half that for each of our discussants, but if all goes well, we'll have time for uh, questions and answers afterwards when they will be able to fill in. So I'll tell you first who all four of the participants are and then we'll go through them one by one. Our first presenter uh, will be Professor Shamika Arlevi, uh, who is currently a visiting fellow at Brookings, India, and has been an assistant professor in the Indian School of Business in Hyderabad. And she will be presenting uh, some of her research on uh, data from the Election Commission of India uh, uh, with a focus on the, uh, how the role of women in Indian democracy can be increased. And our, our second presenter will be Dr. Milan Vaishnav, uh, who is an associate at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And, and before that, a research fellow at the Center for Global Development. And Dr. Vaishnav will be presenting his research on the nexus of corruption, criminality, and Indian politics. And then for our two uh, commentators and discussants, uh, the first will be Suhasini Haider, who, as you all know, is a foreign affairs editor at CNN, IBN, and anchor of. Uh, more than one program, but one which is especially relevant today is uh, Power of 49, a program um, promoting women's participation in the electoral process. And finally, we'll have uh, Professor Jagdeep Chokar, uh, who is a founder and trustee of the Association for Democratic Reforms. And uh, he will be giving us some commentary on the research and uh, some words on how policies can be made more inclusionary uh, in terms of women and exclusionary in terms of criminals in politics. Um, so without taking more of your time, we'll turn now to the first of our presenters, uh, Professor Shamika Ravi. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about missing women in Indian democracy. I'm going to start with the silver lining, and that's because the story of uh, women in India uh, particularly in case of the Indian democracy, is really one of a big cloud. And I'm going to talk about the missing uh, uh, women, but start with the silver lining. Now, what is the silver lining in the story? Essentially that there has been a dramatic improvement in women voter participation in India over the last 50 years. And we have data from 62 to 2012, and what we see is there's a sharp and steady decline in the gender bias. Now, it's really an improvement, but because we started out with such vast gender bias, we're just going to talk about declining in the uh, gender bias. From 715 uh, voters, women voters per thousand male voters in 62, uh, to about 883 in the 2000. So that is a big, big decline. Uh, and it's not just limited to uh, the better off socially, better off states, but even in the traditionally backward states of Bimaru, which is Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, and Uttar Pradesh. The other interesting thing is this decline in the gender bias is really not coming from decreasing male participation. It is really simply coming from increasing female participation because the male participation as voter has dramatically stayed the same for the last 50 years. So in fact, the entire decline in bias is driven by women. Now let me show you some of the pictures. 
In the traditionally backward states of Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, and Uttar Pradesh, the first, the orange line on top is really a fitted uh, 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 value of the electorate sex ratio. Electorate is the part of the population which is registered to vote. So that is the electorate. And if you see, it's, it's, it's high and it's relatively flat across time, which means the sex ratio, and by the way, that is an indicator of the sex ratio in the population. So that's a good approximation of uh, the sex ratio in the population as a whole. And that has remained flat over time. But what you see improving is the voter participation, which is that part of the electorate which is actually going out and casting vote. And that entire increase, if you see, it's in Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh, solely driven by more and more women coming out and voting with time. If you look at the southern states, the story is very similar again. Of course, Kerala. Over time, the sex ratio in the population has also been improving. And in that sense, Kerala is an outlier. But in terms of voter participation, fantastic. It's exactly the same as the rest of the country, doing very well. The other large states, look at Assam, look at Gujarat, Haryana, Madhya Pradesh. Everywhere, the voter participation is improving. In fact, the one sad aspect of this data that appeared extremely sad to me was the declining electorate sex ratio in Haryana. And that is a reflection of the uh, declining sex ratio in the population in Haryana. But if you look at the voter sex ratio, there is a marginal improvement. That means even in places where the sex ratio is really bad, more and more women are coming out and casting their vote over time. That's the story here. The other large states, look at Orissa, Punjab, West Bengal. So then the question is, the rising female voter participation, does it really have any impact? Does it really matter? And the answer is yes, it does. And we basically reached this conclusion by exploiting a natural experiment setting in the 2005 elections in Bihar. Because the 2005 elections were held in February when no single party came out as a majority party. So they did not form a government, and the president's rule was imposed. Six months later, the re-election was held. And then you saw that JDU did come into power. So what we do is, for 243 constituencies in Bihar, we look at what happened to voter turnout between these two elections. There is no new policy. There's nothing new implemented which is pro-women. But clearly what we do see is within the six months, the greater the participation of female voters in a constituency, that is what you have in the x-axis, which is growth rate of women voters, lower the probability of a candidate getting re-elected. And that really is telling you that women were the agents of change in the 2005 elections, which means JDU was basically brought into power thanks to women voters. All right. Moving on to the second aspect, the second story that I'm trying to tell you. Now we move away from the silver lining and we're going to stare at the cloud, which is why do we have so few women in politics? that over time, despite education and development, female representation in politics has remained uh, pretty small. This is global data. The global data tells us that 20% of legislatures in the parliaments in the world are female. All right? This is the data for India. We so then why is it that we have so few women in politics? And using the Indian election data again, we basically test a hypothesis. We have a model. And uh, we test it, and we basically come to you know, some striking findings. Uh, this is, again, the same 50 years data. We look at all state assembly elections. But we explore the role of women candidates. Who is contesting? What are the female candidates, and what are the constituencies that they are contesting in? And where are they winning? To basically get a sense of female participation over time. And what do we find? In terms of result number one, where are women contesting elections? Well, women are more likely to contest elections from constituencies where the sex ratio of electorate is actually worse, which means more and more women are standing or contesting elections in socially backward regions. All right? Which means the probability of female contestants in elections is much higher in places like Bihar and UP than in socially forward states like Kerala and Tamil Nadu. All right, And why is that? Because in states where the voter ratio is in favor of women, they seek representation of their preferences through voting. And that's because contesting elections is costly, and it is costlier for women. All right? This is 
in some sense, a fitted value of what happens to the predicted probability of female contestants over sex ratio of the constituency. And you can see this nice negative relationship. Higher the sex ratio, lesser the probability that female contestants will enter politics as candidates. <coughs> All right? Result number two. Where are the women winning in terms of having contested? Where do female candidates stand a better chance to win? Not surprisingly, women have lower chances from those constituencies where the sex ratio of the electorate is actually against them. What does that mean? That in socially advanced states, women are not contesting. And in the socially backward states, they are contesting, but they are not winning. What do the two things together tell you? Very low female representation in Indian <coughs> politics. This is, again, the relationship between the probability of females winning and against the sex ratio positive. Women do vote for women on an average. All right? And these are average. This is looking at 50 years of data across all the uh, legislative assembly constituencies in the country. Moving to the women's reservation in India now, because naturally the whole idea of the women's reservation is to improve upon this 10%. What about women reservation in India? Well, if the logic, what is our data telling us? That if the logic for reservation is compensatory justice, which means compensating for years of neglect and social backwardness, if the whole logic of reservation is compensatory justice, then reservation should definitely not be random. It should not be randomly for constituencies across the country. In fact, what the data tells you is it should be targeted towards those constituencies where the sex ratio is worse. Because that is the whole idea of compensatory justice. We should target 33% or 30% of the worst gender ratio constituencies to think of reservations. Now, this is to give you uh, data from international parliaments. And the reason I, I like this picture is we see Pakistan, which has close to a little over uh, under 20% female reservation in parliament. We have Philippines, about quarter century back, they have close to 33% reservation for female MPs. So countries have experimented, have started experimenting. So there's a lot of catching up for India to do. So this is just a, a, a reflection of where we stand today. The third story, will reservations really solve women's problems in India? Right? <clears throat> Our estimate using, again, the same Election Commission of India data, where we basically compare the sex ratio in the population with the electorate sex ratio in the population, that gap is telling you that <coughs> registration hasn't been universal. There are people missing in the electoral registration. But what we do is we compare Kerala with all the other states. And what we come up with is an estimate of missing women in the electorate in India. And what we find is 20% of female electorate is missing from the electoral rolls of the Election Commission of India. That's a very big number. In fact, in absolute terms, it amounts to 65 million. But what it is also telling you is that Indian elections, therefore, reveal the will of a population which is artificially skewed against the women population. When 20% of the electorate is missing, what you see as an election outcome or policies which is in response to that election outcome, it does not reflect the true will of the actual population of the country or the counterfactual. Because these women are missing. They are not there in the electoral rules. The average Indian elector, therefore, is increasingly becoming male. It's a male voter who is making the difference in terms of elections. So what about the female electorate? Why is it? Why is 20% missing? Partly because registration is not universal. And again, the registration is also, despite the efforts of the Election Commission, it is skewed. Because we find 9.3% of female electorate in Uttar Pradesh missing, which amounts to millions of women in Uttar Pradesh. 5.7% of female electorate is missing in Bihar. By the way, this is these though depressing numbers, but that's at least something one can do something about. It is a problem that can be handled if the Election Commission proactively went out and registered more and more women. But a large part of this problem of missing women electorate is because there are fewer women in our population. Women are missing from the population of India due to sustained gross neglect of women over all age groups in the life cycle. 
missing women is not a problem because of boy preference or, or female infanticide, which is the usual story we think of. India is dubious for being the country with the highest statistics of female death due to intentional injury. And that is really a sad statistics to be affiliated with. But what it tells you is that missing women is a serious problem, and it's for all age groups in the population. It's not just for uh, infants. Looking at the data from the Panchayati Raj, because in the Panchayati Raj, we've had 30% and subsequently 50% reservation for women, which started in the mid-90s. What are, what are the results as far as reservations doing anything for women welfare? And the results are actually quite mixed. The early set of results, which came out from works of uh, Duflo and Chattopadhyay, which was a very celebrated paper because it showed that women's reservation actually has impact on women's welfare. But another set of equally distinguished researchers use the same data except expand the scope of the data and expand the timeline of the data, they find no impact. It's sad, but if you think about it, it makes sense. Why should female reservation really have any impact on women? Because even those seats which are reserved for women, a handful of women candidates have to contest elections. And they have to cater to the preferences of an average voter. Who is the average voter? Increasingly male. So even if you have reservation, over time, what you will see is that female candidates also cater to the preferences of male voters, because they are the average voters who will bring them into power. That is what we call in economics, it's like market failure in the presence of externalities. When there are fewer women, despite reservation, we're not going to be able to give proper representation to women's preferences in the democracy. I'm going to conclude by basically uh, talking about what exactly do these statistics, do these results tell us about making Indian democracy more inclusive for women? Well, first of all, what we can do something about is an aggressive drive by the Election Commission to go out and register more and more women into the electorate. They have to be given a voice. But largely, and this is beyond the mandate and scope of the Election Commission, it's correcting the sex ratio in the population facing the fact that gross sustained neglect over 60 years has led to 20% of our female electorate, which doesn't exist. Otherwise, given the electoral politics of democracy, it's a majority politics, women's problem will not find a solution within this democratic framework. And Indian democracy would then have failed its female citizens, who are beyond electorates and uh, voters. Thank you.